other any questions to start with? All right. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to get through the whole, um, I don't think we're going to be able to get through the whole Pate of pop up business, but um, we'll be able to start it at least. Um, and maybe get hand away. Um, I'm going to be following uh, Weinberg's treatment. This is in his volume two. And um, so the, actually, let me, let me, I've actually forgotten something. Let me get something from, uh, about half integrals that um, uh, I'm going to have to stick in the book here. I, I hadn't thought they were necessary, but I think they are for the Fatty of Popeye method. And um, let's, let's look at them in a, in a very simple way. Um, the very basic uh, Gaussian integral that I started the chapter on half integral uh, with was this one. Okay, so that um, is a particular uh, Gaussian integral which one can evaluate and see that this is uh, correct for as long as A and B are real. Now, the, as you know, with path integrals, the overall number here doesn't matter. What matters is, um, is essentially uh, the, how the, how the thing depends upon uh, these variables A and B there apart from an overall normalization. And um, in particular, apart from a constant, you notice that this is equal to what this would be if you just said x equal to the minimum here. The minimum, of course, is x equals b, and so you just have an exponential here that's just an exponential of 0. Um, Another way of looking at that is to write this as e to the minus i, which is almost the same integral, but here the square is completed. If we just write it this way, then the answer here is 2 pi over i a e to the i a b e squared over 2. Okay, here you can um, ask when is x minimal here, but when is this exponent stationary for what value of x? And of course, the answer is minus i a x plus i a b equals zero, uh, x is equal to b. And now if you substitute, into this, x equals b, you get minus i a b squared over 2 plus i a b squared, which altogether is i a b squared over 2. And that's actually what occurs um, up there. Okay. Um, in both cases, you get a 1 over the square root of the coefficient of the quadratic term. Um, now, it, there's, there's actually a, a, it, it's actually true much more generally, namely that if you have a functional integral and 
you're, say, integrating um, let us just say here in the, in the DA0, and then you have an E to the I of um, A and A0. Well, the value of this integral, apart from an overall factor, is going to be e to the i a a0 bar, where a0 bar is the value of a0 that minimizes this. So it's the same thing as um, what happened over here in just one dimension. Um, but put it, and, it, and for the same reason, namely that if we're going to do this integration as humans, then it better be Gaussian. And if you're doing a Gaussian integration, then um, what you do is you complete the square. And so the lesson that we learned here gets repeated. All right, I, I, I see there are some frowns and some questions. And um, it's true that the leap from here to there is, is a big one. But um, one can, for example, consider, the, consider this case here. So we're assuming i is quadratic in. A zero? Yes, 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 okay. yes. That's what I meant by we're doing it as humans. Any other questions? Okay. Well, what you can do to, to understand this is you can think about this not for one x, but for, say, x and y, or for x1 through xn, and uh, work through, in fact, that's done in the, uh, that sort of a Gaussian integral is, appears, I hope it's typo free, um, anyway, on, on, on the second page of this chapter on Gaussian integrals. And if you look at that, you can convince yourself that this, that for n variables it's true, and so n going to infinity is uh, something we've done many times. All right. Now, um, there's another uh, basic um, result about pathways, well, about about grasping integrals, at least, and about grasping path integrals, grasping path integrals. And um, it's uh, something that, again, we didn't need to really consider in, when we did the grasping path integrals. But when, if you want to do how do you pop off uh, stuff, then you, then you need to do it. So let's, let's consider the following. E to the minus a theta bar theta, d theta bar d theta. So this is the, the simplest case. And um, in my notes, I was usually setting a equal to 1. But if we don't set a equal to 1, then this is an integral of 1 minus a theta bar theta. The higher terms are 0. We have d theta bar d theta. Well, one term is zero because of the rules. You remember the rules for Grassmann integration. Integral theta d theta is one. Integral theta bar d theta bar is one. Integral d theta is zero. Is the same as integral d theta bars. And everything anti-commutes with everything. Or the theta theta bar anti-commutes with everything. And so this. The 1 vanishes because these two, the, the integral of 1 is 0. It's doubly 0 in this case. And so you rewrite this as a theta theta bar, d theta bar, d theta. This integral is 1, and then this integral is 1, and so altogether you get a. 
So um, this tells us that the integral of a Gaussian is just that coefficient. Okay. Now, if we instead had um, something that was a matrix here, and we had n thetas and n theta bars, then you can sort of imagine what it would be because of the anti-symmetry, it would be the determinant. Um, we can actually work that out for the case of two. And um, so let's, let's consider that integral, say, e to the minus, uh, it's basically a11 theta bar 1 theta 1 minus a12 theta bar 1 theta 2 minus a21 theta bar 2 theta 1 minus a22 theta bar 2 theta 2. And then we have d theta bar, uh, say 1, d theta 1, d theta bar 2, d theta 2. Okay. Now, well, all right. So you expand this out. And um, the square of any of these terms is zero. And so what are the terms that, that, that are non-zero? Well, for example, when this comes down, you get a term that is minus a11 times minus a12. And it's uh, a11 then a22 theta bar 1 theta bar, I'm sorry, theta 1 theta bar 2 theta 2, and then when you do this integration, uh, you just get a, a plus 1. Okay. That's one. But on the other hand, you can also have a uh, an a12 times an a21, but now you have theta bar 1 theta 2, theta 2 bar theta 1. And now, if you try to put this structure in the same form as this, so that the integration gives you a plus 1, you see that you can move the theta 1 across the 2 theta 2's, and you just get 2 minus signs. But then you need to permute the theta 2 with the theta 2 bar. Although actually what you do is you move the, well, if you want. Yeah, I guess that's what you All right. Anyway, You've got to have them in like the opposite order of the, the differentials, right? Because you want to do theta It doesn't one. matter whether you have these guys. Two, the product of two d thetas is boson. Mm -hmm. So you can have any order of You can have a 2, 2, 1, 1, or 1, 1, 2, 2. But you don't want to waltz around with 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2. Or you get an overall sign. So for regular, um, for, regular for these Gaussian integrals, sorry, right, here, here. We're, for these Gaussian integrals, if you had a matrix, the determinant would appear in the denominator, right? That's right. And, and that's, here, that's what we noticed here. here. And so if you're doing a, a bosonic or an ordinary path integral, the analogous determinant appears in the denominator. And um, so what you what you wind up with here is it's a11, a22, minus a12, a21. And of course, I left out the one halves and then the fact that you get two terms. But anyway, this is determinant of the matrix A. And it's more generally true that if you have an integral e to the minus uh, theta bar i, a i j, theta j, product i equals 1 to n, d theta bar i, d theta i, then um, this is equal to the determinant of the matrix A. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so those are two things that I wanted to 
you just mentioned. Now the question is, um, I think we could change classrooms and trapes down to 184 with her, as I said, pristine blackboards. Do you want to do that or not? Would you rather say, do you find this? Well, we've got the camera set up and everything, so might as well stay here. All right. symmetric so if you if nu is zero mu can't be zero so there's no time derivative of the um, of a zero here and so as you remember in the canonical quantization of the just the let alone canonical quantization just the, me the conventional mechanics the canonical momentum is the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative or something. And so pi alpha zero, which would be partial of Lagrange density with respect to the time derivative of the uh, zeroth component of any of the uh, gauge fields is zero, again, because of this anti-symmetry. So that's, um, that's called what Dirac called a primary constraint. Um, there's another constraint which can be called a secondary constraint, which is um, the field equation for A0. And, um, and so this is just Lagrange's equation for the field A alpha 0. And um, this is minus d mu of the partial Lagrange density of d mu a alpha zero plus the partial Lagrange density with respect to A alpha zero. And as I guess you guys learned in the homework problem, this is d mu f uh, mu zero alpha plus f gamma mu zero and then there's c gamma alpha beta a beta mu and then a j zero alpha, whereas this j zero alpha comes from the derivative of the matter Lagrangian with respect to a zero alpha. And um, all right, so this equation is Gauss's law is partial k of um, you see this one over here. Where mu is zero, 
you're going to get zero, and so the rest are partial k and the derivative of L with respect to um, uh, to anyway, the, 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 this one here for k, this thing is called uh, pi k, and the reason it's called pi k is that um, a pi k uh, would be, or pi alpha k would be the partial Lagrange density with respect to the time derivative of, um, of uh, a k um, alpha. And um, that is f k alpha zero. And so this, I haven't made any um, mistakes here. That's the divergence of this. This is effectively the electric field. This is effectively E, the non-abelian electric field. Um, plus pi gamma k C m alpha beta a beta k and then plus j alpha zero to zero. So this is Gauss's law. It's the non-abelian generalization of the divergence of E equals rho and um, what you see is that this is instead the covariant divergence wow, of the covariant uh, electric field. And it, there's not an electric field. Instead, there's a set of electric fields, one for each, uh, one for each uh, value of, the, of, of, of either well, it's 1 to 3 for SU2, 1 to 8 for um, um, SU10. And so it would be essentially an AB. It's a dot in the space indices. And then an AB, well, he uses Greek, so I have to use Greek, I guess. Um, and this would be uh, rho alpha, essentially. Often perhaps a sign. Okay, well, there are many, um, and at this point, what one does is one um, chooses a gauge. And so you pick a gauge and you quantize in that gauge. And there are various choices. Um, Schwinger um, actually quantized in uh, the radiation gauge. That's the, basically the hardest gauge to, to, to work the, to quantize in. Um, some people quantize in what's called the temporal gauge. That's this one. And uh, other people quantize in what's called the axial gauge, and they almost always pick the z component as the uh, axial gauge. And so we're going to follow Weinberg who, pick, who chooses the axial gauge. And when you have a three alpha equal to zero, well, that isn't in the Lagrange density, and so you're instead of having three conjugate momenta, you only have two. And Weinberg calls them pi alpha i, and they're partial of Lagrange density with respect to d zero a alpha i. So these are um, these, this is effectively it's minus f alpha zero i. This is, apart from a possible sign, this is the alpha electric field. So there are n electric fields in an SUN theory. And this is uh, d zero a alpha i minus di a i a alpha zero plus c alpha beta gamma a beta zero a gamma And by the way, I've put these notes online. Okay, so I made a, an enlarged uh, Xerox of this and uh, posted them online. So in particular, F I zero alpha is pi alpha I, and F alpha three zero is just d3 a alpha 0. In other words, there isn't any 
A alpha 3, so the rest of these terms, uh, there would be a D0, A alpha 3, that's 0, and then there would be a product with the C's of A alpha 0 and A alpha 3, since A alpha 3 is 0, that's gone. Whereas um, this one has the full structure for I equals 1 to 2. So Weinberg is using one to I for 1, 2, and K for 1, 2, 3. And of course, mu for 0 to 0, 3. OK, and this um, constraint, namely Gauss's law, um, is, is, simplifies a little bit. Namely, when you have the D3 and then pi 3 alpha, well, um, pi 3 alpha is effectively this. And um, so, the, the, so Gauss's law turns into uh, minus D3 squared A0 alpha. And that is um, Di i alpha i plus i gamma i c gamma alpha beta a beta i plus j alpha zero. Okay, so that's that's um, the Gauss's law constraint. And the point here is that you can solve this for a alpha zero. So this becomes a dependent variable. Remember, in the case of, uh, Coulomb's, uh, of, of Coulomb's gauge, what we did was we found that A0 became a dependent variable. And in the case of for QED, in the case of QED, we were able to remove A0 completely from the Lagrangian. But here, um, the Lagrangian is um, F mu nu squared and um, and uh, so uh, there just isn't any simple way of removing. You, you, you don't remove A0. So. This J0 that we've been talking about is, um, oh well, uh, Weinberg writes it as minus I pi L, T alpha, L M, Psi M. And this thing is effectively Psi bar. Um, so that, that's what that is. We're going to be focusing, though, mainly on the, on the gauge fields and not on the matter fields. And now, um, the Hamiltonian density, then, is, um, as usual, you take pi alpha I times D0 of alpha I. And then you do the same thing for the matter variables. And then you subtract the Lagrange density. The Lagrange density being that thing onto the clock over there. And so this is pi alpha i. And now this, um, this structure here, d0 alpha i, well, you can, you can see, you can replace D0 alpha i with F0 i alpha, and then pull over these terms. And so this becomes uh, F0, F alpha 0 i plus Di A alpha 0 minus C alpha beta gamma. A beta 0, A gamma I. And then there's this term, which is plus um, basically pi L D 0 psi L, where L here is going from 1 to 3, and SU2, and so forth. And now we subtract this L, and that means um, we're subtracting a half F alpha 0 I at alpha zero i, so this is i equals one two. These are the ones that we're actually quantizing. Then we have the co uh, color magnetic field 
which just uh, involves AIJ. And then we have the part of the color magnetic field, or I'm saying color. I guess it's appropriate to say color because we're thinking in terms of an unbroken gauge theory and the one that's in the standard model is QCD. Um, talking about a theory you don't understand. Alpha I3, F alpha I3. And then, um, and then the analog of this one, but uh, for the case of of three minus a half f alpha zero three f alpha zero three and then minus the Malachondry. So this is the Hamiltonian density. And um, we can we can rewrite that as the matter Hamiltonian density, namely this minus that. But um, now Let's see. Um, we have, we can take this, these two minus these two are going to give us effectively a half pi alpha i squared. And um, what, what, what remains after doing that is a, is a sort of cross term p alpha, pi alpha i E I A alpha zero minus C alpha beta gamma um, A beta zero A gamma I and then a half pi alpha I pi alpha I and then these terms which are um, a half F alpha i j, well, I'm just going to say squared, and then a half uh, d3 a alpha i uh, squared. And let's see, there's one more. Minus a half d3 a alpha zero, and then this one is um, squared. Okay. So this is our, our Hamiltonian here. Hamiltonian density. All right, so what we can imagine is saying, let's have a, a gauge field uh, A prime and a matter field psi prime, e to the minus i epsilon h A psi. So suppose we're computing this. Okay. So then we insert, as usual, this um, complete set of pi states and pi states and um, this will give us this is the Paul Weinberg skips um, this would give us a um, well you basically put in the pi's and um, this would just repeat itself as um, uh, you get e to the minus i epsilon script h uh, d cubed x. But then you get the inner products of a prime uh, pi prime like this and um, uh, pi prime a from inserting a complete set of states and they would give you a um, e to the i integral, basically a prime minus a times, let me call it pi rather than pi prime, uh, d cubed x. And then we call this a dot. And um, multiply by epsilon. So this would be epsilon there. And um, we call this thing a dot. And which are the ones that we're sticking in? Well, we're only, we're only sticking in the components one and two, because those are the ones we're quantizing. 
And um, so this would be I, and the cos and alpha. And, um, but don't you have to stick in the complete set? Well, the complete set of pi's here for the gauge fields is, um, remember, uh, let's see, A3 is gone and A0 is a dependent variable. So the complete set is just A1 and A2. And the corresponding pi's are pi 1 and pi 2. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying that it's obvious that this is the case, but I don't know. It's, it's, I'm cramming an awful lot of stuff into, into one lecture here. So, so I think we ought to redo this in the second semester. So we're, on the right-hand side, there's going to be an integration over all A, I, A, A alpha I, or? Right, right. Well, we have that anyway. Or I um, alpha I. So, so, in other words, th this is the case, in other words, for, uh, this is effectively the action times the time slice of width epsilon. And um, so the whole, the whole thing then is um, that basically A prime, psi prime, even a minus I, TH, A psi, and um, you might stick in a gauge invariant operator there. It would be a path integral of E. Um, and Weinberg, I, I think this is ghastly pedagogy, but he uses capital I for the action, so he has I I, which I guess is minus one. But um, um, it doesn't mean anything like. Lydian action or something. And, 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 let me just say this is then DA1, uh, DA2. Or, or, or I'll get to your question in just a second. D alpha I and of course D psi L. And I think we're done there. Where I now is the ordinary action. Um, well, I should say, I shouldn't say ordinary action. It's pi alpha i, d0, a alpha i, those are these terms, plus, of course, pi l, d0, psi l, because we insert also the matter complete sets of states. And then minus h, d4, x, where h was this whole sh schmear here. OK, so there we are at that stage. Now, the next thing gets back to, you might wonder why did you start with these the simple ideas about the math integrals here. By the way, we have another decision coming up. Um, boards start out, start, I mean, these boards are never good, even when they're clean, because they're green. Um, I mean, it, it, they could be worse, it could be white. And we'd be writing white on white, but instead it's white on white, bright green. Um, so now, second time around, it's going to be really very hard. You guys want to go to 184 where we're going to have nice blackboards? Would you rather stay here where we've got all these formulas on the board? All right, I mean, tell me, I'm happy either way. Uh, I'm close enough to the board, I can see what I mean, but... We can stay here. All right. The principle of least action. Okay. Now, it turns out, and this is the point that Weinberg makes, that um, I haven't seen anybody else make, but he, he makes a big deal of it. Remember, when you have an ordinary Gaussian integration over real variables, what happens? The thing, you can either integrate or you can just say, eh, I'm tired. I don't want to do the integration. Let's just um, replace the thing we're, thing we're integrating over with its value at the minimum, the value that keeps the thing stationary. All right. What Weinberg does is he does that backwards. 
Because there, we're told to integrate over A1 and A2. A3 is 0. Um, but A0 is constrained. It's a dependent variable. But it depends, as you can see from those formulas on the back wall, in a complicated way upon all the other fields in the problem, including the momenta. Okay, because it comes out of the constraint is Gauss's law, which involves the electric field, the divergence of the electric field equals rho, the, the non abelian analog of that. And that means that A0, the, 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 very, the NA zeros are all um, functions in a funny way of, I mean, they're not hopelessly complicated, but they're functions of all these other variables. So what Weinberg says is, you know, if you integrate it over A0, what would you get? Well, apart from maybe some overall constant that we don't care about, you, you would get um, if we integrated over this, what we would get would be the value of that whole thing where A0 is stationary. But the value of, but that whole thing there is actually the action. And the value of A0 when the action is stationary is the value of A0 as determined by Gauss's law. So instead of trying to do that miserable Gauss, that miserable path integral over A1 and A2, you do the integral over A1 and A2 and A0. Um, uh, one question. It is the same as the one that you get from Gauss's law because the Gauss's law is the equation that is derived by minimizing the action. That's right. Okay, it's like the Lagrangian. Right. You don't want it? No, I want it. Oh! <laughs> yes. The field equations come about from saying that the action should be stationary. Yeah. A brilliant statement. Field equations come out by saying that the action is stationary. Uh, one of the field equations is the constraint of Gauss's law. And so we can either go crazy and substitute the value of A0 in terms of these other variables, in which case we have some horribly nonlinear. I mean, it wouldn't be a quadratic Gaussian integral anymore. Not that it is completely here, but it, we can pretend that it is. Um, or we can imagine doing it in perturbation theory. Whereas instead, if we just, uh, we, we can say, oh, we're just going to integrate over A0. Because that's the same thing as replacing A0 by its stationary value. Okay. So now, our, um, so that was the reason for this lesson in the beginning. And presumably the coefficient of A0 squared, which would, in other words, the square of the term is just some uninteresting constant in this case. So what we've got then is, um, in fact, if I just skip through, we've got the time-ordered product of O1, O2, ON, a bunch of gauge invariant operators. Omega then is going to be a ratio of path integrals. And at this stage, the path integrals are E to the I, and I don't know, I'll call this S prime, the O's. And now we have DA1 uh, alpha. D A two out. In fact, we're integrating over all all but A three. And then D psi L. And we, well, I should say we also have uh, the integrations over the pi's. And 
Well, it turns out that the integrations over the pies do the usual thing for us. In other words, the integrations over the pies just, um, just turn the Hamiltonian density into the Lagrangian density in the usual way. So what we now have for S prime is it's an integral, say, d4 of x, and let me just um, get this uh, straight here. It's, well, it's certainly the Mal-Lagrangian. And then a half f alpha 0 i f alpha 0 i. So the integral of the pi i's give us, um, give us that. And then we already had minus a half f alpha i j. Let me just square that. And then we have minus a half uh, d3 alpha i n squared and a half d3 a alpha 0 uh, squared. OK, so now uh, this is what we're integrating. And we're integrating over 3 of these variables, but a3 is always 0. And so now the next thing we can do is we can say, well, suppose, suppose we, instead of just having a3 automatically 0, suppose we, well, this is a ratio of path integral, so let me just divide by the denominator and not repeat it. So this is then, what we can say is that this, this is the full action with all the fields in it, and then O1 through Om, and now dA alpha mu d psi l, but now a delta function of A alpha 3. In other words, in other words, if we stick in a functional delta function here, then we can, in this case, we here we have d three of alpha i. We can we can add in a di of alpha 3, and then an alpha 3 times the structure constants times alpha i. And then over here, we have this alpha 0, which is now just a variable of integration. We, and we have d3 of alpha 0. We can subtract d0 of alpha 3, and the structure constants times the alpha 0 alpha 3. So now we've got the full gauge invariant action here. And we're integrating over all the gauge fields. And all we've got is this constraint. So that's, um, that's what, uh, that's, basic, that's basically the goal that I had for this lecture. Uh, going beyond this is, is somewhat difficult because this is a, all the complicated business we go beyond it. But um, since we do have uh, 20 minutes left, uh, I can try. So let, let me first invite questions, because this is a natural stopping point. That is to say, we, 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 we get this expression where we're integrating over everything. This is the gauge invariant action. And we just have this double function. So S prime was the action where we'd already used the fact that A alpha 3 was 0? That's right. Mm -hmm. this, is the, the, this is the full action, but with A3 0. And once again, the clever thing in getting this derivation is, is, is using this trick of saying that instead of hopelessly trying to integrate over the pies, those are the complete sets of 
country of Clementa, with A0 constrained, doing that first. Instead, we integrate over A0 because that's effectively just replacing it by its constrained value. And once A0 is a free variable that's unconstrained, we can do the pi integrations without any trouble. Whereas doing the pi integrations when A0 is constrained is essentially impossible because the A0 depends upon the pi's. How do you know that the integrals can be done in arbitrary order like that? Yeah. Or we're just adding things. Addition is commutative. But it's a, I mean, it's a good question if you want to be rigorous, I'm sure. But um, this is, at the level of rigor at which I'm operating, that's not a question I would entertain. <laughs> All right. Now, the next topic, the next statement, and I'm not going to go through this in, in any kind of detail at all, is, and of course this is really d psi, d psi bar. So you can imagine that this is gauge invariant. And it turns out there are cases when it might not be, but in general, uh, for the case we're considering it is. You can also show that in fact this measure is gauge invariant. Um, let's see, maybe I'll pause and say something about that. The, the reason is that, you remember we, can, we derived what an infinitesimal non abelian gauge transformation is. I was using my notation wrong, Weinberg's. If I use Weinberg's then it's A mu lambda alpha. Now lambda is the gauge parameter. Uh, this is a mu alpha plus a d mu of a lambda alpha, and then the structure constant c alpha beta gamma a mu beta lambda gamma. Okay, so this is this is uh, the gauge field after a small gauge transformation with uh, n parameters lambda alpha. How we're going to 1 to 3 press you to 1, 1 to 8 press you in. Okay. And so what is the what is the change here? Well, what you can argue is that the product over alpha mu and space of d a lambda alpha mu of x. Uh, is Weinberg calls it the determinant of some matrix N times the product of the dA uh, alpha mu of X. So the same thing but without the lambda. And this thing is, is basically a This, is ba this n is basically a variational derivative of a lambda alpha, lambda alpha mu of x with respect to a beta mu y. And this is delta fourth of x minus y, a delta mu mu, and then delta alpha beta plus c alpha beta gamma lambda gamma of x. And the point is that for infinitesimal lambda, this determinant is just a constant. And it's, um, it's basically that all of these lambda terms are, um, well, it's actually, it's actually a, little, a little bit more Tricky. It's in fact that uh, the trace of the structure, the trace of C alpha, in other words, C alpha alpha gamma vanishes, and that's because the structure constants are anti-symmetric. So what you can argue then is 
that if you if you imagine trying to trying to compute the determinant of this, um, it would be um, zero because of the anti-symmetry of the structure constants. Um, we could, if you want, pause and do this in detail for um, SU2. Do you want? So I, I wonder what are ghosts? The ghosts that uh, all right. That's how they are. Okay, I can, all right, let, let me get to what ghosts are, but this is, um, a technical argument that we have to go through to get there, but basically, it's what I was saying over here, but a rate, oh, no, it's over here. Remember that if you do a Gaussian, um, Grassmann integration, it's the determinant rather than one over the determinant? Okay. It turns out that when we, when we go to the next step, namely trying to change the gauge from axial gauge to uh, a gauge of d mu, a mu, alpha equal to zero. Why, why is that the next thing to do? Or like why, why are we not happy? Because the day of Papa. We're not happy because <laughs> if we were, um, Remember with QED, what we had here was the divergence of A equal to zero. Well, that's not a fun gauge to work at because the propagator is very asymmetrical. So what we did was we performed a, uh, we actually did two things. One thing was we showed that this, all right, let me, let me back up. What we can see is, well, suppose you, first of all, Right, let, let me go part way toward the fatty of Papa, and I'll tell you, make sure I tell you what ghosts are before the class ends. The next thing to do, all right, let, let, let's not go into detail. Maybe I should make this a homework problem. Um, next semester. For next semester. <laughs> um, but uh, you can show then that this thing is gauge invariant, this is gauge invariant, this is obviously gauge invariant. These are chosen gauge invariant, okay? So the only non-gauge invariant thing is this thing, all right? On the other hand, we can, we're integrating over all of these gauge fields, and we can decide, well, and all of these matter fields, we can say, well, instead of integrating over the standard set, let's just make a gauge transformation, in which case we're just shuffling them all around. And, um, and so this thing is the same thing. Well, I erased the denominator, unfortunately. But this is the same thing as integral e to the i s tilde o tilde through o n tilde the a tilde d psi tilde delta of A tilde. So this is equal to this, but on the other hand, these guys are all gauge invariant, so the tilde, doesn't, the tilde goes away. But it doesn't go away here. Okay. And so the next trick is to say, all right, um, so what we can do, now, now we, we did the same thing for this case of QED. In the case of QED, this is alpha 3. In the case of QED, we had just del dot A, and we said, um, well, what was the change in del dot A? Well, that was delta of del dot A minus Laplacian of whatever the gauge function was. So in QED, it was very simple to say what that was. And so what we said was, OK, uh, we, can, we have two choices. We just integrate over all gauges. And if we do, we just get that this thing is a ratio of path integrals um, in which uh, we're integrating over all gauge fields, no gauge fixing at all. And in fact, we can do that here also for the non-abelian case. Let me just write the denominator there as d. Um, in other words, this is the gauge transform one, 
we can now integrate, and we're into, we also have the gauge transform one down here, delta of A tilde. And now we can just integrate in the numerator and the denominator over all gauge transformations, in which case this delta function just simply goes away, and we get some overall constant which cancels. And so we can say that this thing is the ratio of E to the IS, the O's, integrate over all fields, divided by E to the integral E to the IS, integrate over all fields. So that was the choice we had in the case of the. What do you mean we can integrate over all gauge transformations? Over all fields. Oh. When, when, effectively, when you integrate over all gauge transformations, it's the same thing as integrating over all fields without any gauge fixing at all. In other words, by integrating over all gauge transformations, we remove this constraint, and so we're just integrating over all fields without the constraint. So that's one way of doing it. And that's what one would do in lattice gauge theory. On the other hand, if you want to do perturbation theory, uh, you want to fix the gauge. And so, um, in that case, what we have to do is figure out, uh, is instead of just integrating over all gauge functions, what we do is we multiply this by something like e to the i minus i over 2c integration um, d mu a mu alpha squared d fourth x. So we multiply um, by this and um, uh, okay now remember when we were doing QED we did something similar um, and then we just uh, integrated over the gauge uh, um, transformations, the delta function then through set, set uh, Laplacian of lambda equal to del dot a, and the del dot a popped up here. We didn't actually use this, we used something analogous to this. One could do a similar thing here, and in order to achieve the same result, as in the QED, so this is almost it's the same thing as the QED gauge fixing term, but you have n of them. In order to do it, the there's an extra um, determinant that occurs, and so what you wind up with is when you integrate over the gauge fields, you wind up with you you manage to get this in the in the in the action but you get a big determinant, determinant of something that I think Weinberg calls F. Okay, so, and the part that I'm gonna skip now but do next semester is, um, how do you compute F? And um, what is F? <laughs> but let's just assume that we have F, okay? Once you have F, how do you get the determinant of f. Well, one way of doing it is to use this trick over here. That is to say that the determinant is the same thing as a Grassmann integration. And so what one does is one inter introduces scalar, grass scalar fields that are Grassmann. Okay, so we're violating spin statistics, but hell, we're just doing this in order to get a determinant. Okay. And since we're determined to get the determinant... It's um, not totally clear to me why this violates spin statistics. Well, a scale of fermionic field. Oh, okay. This is the ghost field. And, um... So what you do is you introduce Uh, 
the, by the way, the upshot is that the propagator that we're going to be using is the one that we've already used. In other words, it's just, you know, I think it's a minus i, eta mu nu, delta alpha beta over p squared, plus or minus i epsilon, depending on what metric you use. All right, now, this determinant, all right, here's the deal. You write this determinant of f, and seeing what f is is, is, the, is the part that I'm skipping over here. You write it as a e to the i, i g h. Why do you use g h for ghost? I don't know. But anyway, and we have uh, d omega. In his notation, the omega star of x, the uh, omega. In other words, what I was calling d theta bar d theta. And what is this i? This i ghost is an integral d fourth x, d fourth y, omega star alpha of x, omega beta of y, f alpha x beta y, and that's, that's um, because this matrix, I call it a matrix, but it's, a, it's an infinite dimensional matrix, and um, the two of the indices are space-time, so you have two space-times, the other two would just go from one to n, and alpha and beta. Um, and, all right, so let's see what uh, F actually is in this um, in this particular case. F F is a variational derivative of B mu A mu alpha lambda X. So this is the gauge transform one. With respect to lambda beta of Y lambda equals zero. So that's that's what actually this, uh, this f is. And again, we're skipping over things very fast, but let's just do it. So we have this is delta fours of x minus y plus the structure constants alpha gamma beta it turns out d by dx mu of a mu gamma of x delta four of x minus y. By the way, if the warrant an A mu here, we just blow this away. We'd say this determinant was just a constant. The trouble is, it's a constant that involves the gauge field, and so it's not a trivial. It's not a well. It's not a constant because it involves the gauge field. And so that's what um, F is. Those two terms. And so we just substitute those two terms in here. Well, this thing that's box of delta fourth, that's, uh, let me erase the top line here. That is, that just gives you uh, the free action for a, uh, in other words, the final Lagrange density is, for the, is is L matter minus a quarter F alpha mu nu F alpha, well, I guess he does it this way, alpha mu nu minus 1 over 2 C D mu A mu alpha uh, D nu A nu alpha. And then this just converts this to minus d mu omega alpha star d mu omega alpha. So this is just the action for a complex scalar field, but it's a fermionic scalar field. In other words, a Grassmann scalar field. And then this term well, it's got this delta function, it's got a derivative, 
and it's got an A mu. And so the derivative you can swing over and have act on the Grassmann field. And this extra term then is plus C alpha beta gamma D mu omega star alpha A mu gamma omega beta. I don't know why you wrote it that way, but anyway, that's the way it is, and the D mu is only there. So when the dust settles, your new Lagrangian is the one that you wanted, plus a gauge fixing term that you wanted, this means you get the nice propagator. And then you get something you just have to live with that is, um, that involves these, uh, a free, uh, in fact, not A, but N scalar Grassmann fields. And then uh, they interact in a funny way with derivatives and gauge fields okay, like that. And so these guys are the ghosts. And well, he doesn't write down the ghost in interaction, but you can see what what you're going to have. Namely, you're going to have a um, So let's see, if you're going to have something like this, so if this is say, that's a gamma I guess, this is a mu gamma, and then this is a, uh, a beta here and an alpha there, but you're going to have a momentum on, on this and a structure constant. So you're going to have these new vertices that look like that pictorially look like this and will involve, um, because of the derivative, that will pull down the momentum, I guess, on that line. And so it'll look something like C alpha beta gamma I P mu. Um, and then uh, whatever the on mu on that, and um, so the vertex would be essentially something like that. Um, Does it make sense to, I mean, could you calculate <laughs> the amplitude for a diagram with external grasping fields? No, because there aren't any external grasping fields. In fact, I mean, it seems like the Lagrange density allows there to be. Yes. So those are just nonsense? They're not external. They're just there in the action. Remember, we're computing this. These are our gauge invariant sure, sure. operators and so on and so forth. And they're the real operators that we're talking about. Okay. Not only aren't there any external Grassman fields, but you really don't have, I mean, in a sense, you really don't have any incoming gauge bosons or fermions because everything's confined if the, at least according to the standard model, if this is an unbroken gauge theory. So um, if you were being really serious, what you would say is you've got some two hat, well, you could have an electron coming in and then a hadron. And the hadron would be colorless. It would be maybe quark, anti-quark, lots of gluons. But they're all they're all wrapped up in a, in a color neutral thing. And uh, so you don't have any actual external gluons, which I think might be why this is all in a sense consistent, because you see what would have been if you were talking about real gauge bosons that you know were like photons that you could see and detect as free particles, you'd really want them to be, if they were massless, you'd want them to have the two degrees of freedom of an ordinary photon, as to say two polarizations, right? And so you'd really want to quantize in 
cruel gauge. But of course, since everything is gauge invariant, we could have, um, in a sense, imagined that we started out in Coulomb gauge and then gone through this whole procedure, and we would have wound up in the same place. Okay. All right, so that's uh, all. So um, the hope is that at least six people will sign up for 524. Um, you signed up, uh, Alan? I already read something. Yeah. All right. Well, 